I hope you found that um, video as entertaining as I did. As you may tell, I am a very flamboyant person and I'm not afraid to act dramatic in front of the class. I find drama a great way to teach children and our learners around us. Try and be someone different and have a laugh. We don't, education does not have to be something so serious where it's pen to paper at all times. So what I want to go through throughout this um, PowerPoint is about personalization, differentiation of our SMH learners. <clears throat> First thing I want to do is apologize if I make any mistakes, I murmur. If I like pauses, long pauses, or if something doesn't come across the way I intend it to. So I do apologize. As you all are professionals within your areas, you are used to teaching to an audience and not to a screen where there's no one else there, which that person will then listen to at a later time. So hopefully this will go the way we want it to go. So I wanted to add this bit in just to share apologize before we start. So what's our aims of this then? I want us to understand how to recognize emotions, to analyze the information, to incorporate practical approaches and to demonstrate personalization for the nurture of our SAMH learners. I want to encourage them and ourselves to try new challenges, take ourselves out of our comfort zone slightly and then celebrate it by saying, well done, give yourself a pat on the back. On the back. God, that was hard. How did you manage it? Make them small steps first, then increase the, um, the challenges over time. The best way to talk and to express who I am is to talk who I am. So my name's John Blades. I'm the social emotional mental health lead teacher at Parkside at Phoenix Park Academy. I'm also lucky enough to be the Wellspring Academy social emotional mental health expert practitioner. I'm hoping these slides will take you through an emotional journey that hopefully that you can reflect on yourselves or the journey you've been through, but also our learners. So a little bit about my past and maybe you can reflect on your past. I started as a sales assistant at Couplands. Absolutely love this job. Closing time. Let's eat. That's what it was like. 30% off meals during the day. Who could ask for more? As time went on, I started thinking about what I wanted to do for the future. Because during my time at school, I was a nightmare child. I would probably have ended up in one of the settings I'm in now if it wasn't for my amazing teachers that I had where I was. So I got offered a part-time job at Sport and Play Development, as well as on the side, a teaching assistant role within a primary school. This was 40 hours a week, and for a person at 18 years old, I thought about, first thing, the coinage, the money, where that could get me, driving lessons, etc., stuff like that. Thoroughly enjoyed my time working in primary school, but I needed to learn how to curve my tongue. That was no longer in school. I was actually in a teaching profession. So I decided to move on and work as a transport manager for Wing Canton and B&Q, which was based in Manchester. From this, I learned how to curve my tongue. I was in charge of 40 plus beefy lorry drivers, who all know lorry drivers have a sense of humour so dry, you've just got to take it and not react to it. Over this time of this short-term contract, it built me up to wanting to return back to school and thinking that I've made a mistake leading my last profession. I started to come in, um, I applied for a job, sorry, as a learning mentor stroke HLTA at Phoenix House and luckily back in 2010 was offered the job. From then, I've moved on to be a teacher and then now a social, emotional, mental health teacher within my setting, which I am extremely, extremely proud of. So what is a social, emotional and mental health? It is children and young people that experience a wide range of social, emotional activity, um, difficulties, sorry, which manifest themselves in many ways. These may include becoming withdrawn or isolated, as well as displaying challenging, disruptive and disturbing behaviours. 
Now, I know within my setting, a lot of our children will display negative behaviours because they cannot deal with their inner emotion of themselves. They find showing anger the easiest option. So from there, we looked at personalising their lessons. So personalisation refers to a piece of learning and an instru um, instructional approach which are then optimised for the needs of each learner. And this is something that can make it a sequence from a starting point to a finishing point. But making sure that these lessons for your learners are meaningful and relevant for the learners within your setting. So we looked at emotions that we use and starting to incorporate within my setting at Parkside. We implemented a PSD stroke SEMH sessions daily. Something that we designated and designed for our children to talk about their emotions and each day would be different. One day could be friendship. One could, could, could be their inner emotion. One could be literally about how their day has been. Having time to talk. When Dan goes about the talk about books and then the gremlin inside of us, we all have a gremlin inside of us. I can remember being a child that that naughty gremlin would tell me to do many things where that nice gremlin would go, you don't need to do that. But then the nasty gremlin would be going, no, you do that right now. You tell that person what you want to tell them. And you can imagine that's the same for the children within our settings. So we talk about the managing emotion side of it and recognising it but also incorporating teen games and Lego, Lego education within them. I want to show a little bit of personalization in action. You can see me from my bald head. That is me. Music in the background, four of us playing Una. Absolutely Una, love Una. And how we incorporate this to get people to talk, but also talk about that we don't always have to win. Sometimes we have to come second or third or fourth. Incorporate memory games into our academic studies. Because I've always been passionate that if a person is not emotionally stable, they cannot access the academics. So you can incorporate different things to him. 21, counting. Feelings and emotions. Talk about what they like about themselves. Because I know, which I'll go into more detail soon, that people feel quite negative about themselves. This is something that can be done on a one-to-one -one basis using Play-Doh, which you can see from the picture. We can use Lego. Now, we're going to talk about something about Lego, about an autistic child that I used to have in my settings with him in a primary school. This autistic child, which we all know, liked to have their pens, pencils and everything in one place. And he put his desk under a small alcove within the, in the classroom. From there, I created a lesson using Lego about their emotions. They couldn't talk, they just had to build what their emotion was. This young person did the classroom. He was little Lego pieces as himself, as the teacher, as other children in the classroom. I put red bricks around his desk. He then told us that he felt lonely and no one wanted to play with him during break times. And this is what he felt when he came into school. And I'm pleased over time that we devised plans to actually gain friendships and put other people in the classroom to understand his own needs as well. So I want to talk about my emotional journey to work. And this is what I showed the kids during one lesson. I woke up really tired and nervous. This morning I was delivering a similar session to our Wellsprings Academy Trust. I could hear the seagulls bickering in the background. You know, when it's early, you just want them to shut up. I brush my teeth and then brush my hair. Well, kind of what's left of it. Like again, some of you that probably know me will be giggling that fact that I am going bald. I grab my bag and whilst moaning about the long drive ahead, I picked up my college um, colleagues and started the 52 mile journey to work. My friends mentioned how quiet I'll be in the car, and news I am in the morning because it's still early. So they both just fell asleep. Felt quite lonely. I got stuck behind the car doing 30 miles an hour on the motorway. Now we all know that this is one of our bugbears. It's 60, 70 miles an hour down the motorway, and people need to stick by that. That made me quite fuming. I started to get angry. 
in the car. But who could argue with barring myself? So again, them inner thoughts of me arguing with that demon. Sight of the Humber Bridge. Only halfway there. Kind of got a bit excited. The fog and the mist was really low. So as I went over the Humber Bridge, it was like I was gliding ab above the um, fog. Lovely sight. Put down. Off we go down the noisy motorway. That's it. I paused there to make you all think about that motorway, the A180. What an absolute nightmare of a road. So loud. Definitely wake you up in the morning. And I arrived to school one hour and 20 minutes later, exhausted. Even though I was exhausted, I had to still prepare myself and wake myself up, ready for the learners coming into school. So I tried this with a group. So it's activity time. Why don't you try it? I asked him, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell? What did you touch? And what did you taste? And how did that make you feel? So I did this with one of our learners. Oh, I'm sending you an emotional journey with him. Goes in the minibus on the way home, gets stuck at traffic lights. Red light, feels annoyed, angry, because he wants to be home quicker. He passes houses on his way home, wishing that he lived closer to school, because now he would have been home. He sees his house. He's happy to see his mum, and then says hello, and he's out of the house straight away, off to his girlfriend. That's the thing he talks about and looks forward to every day. Now, for this person, he would just grunt and say, meh, and don't want to be involved in stuff. I found out from research that 60% of young people have these difficulties. So I asked him, I said, could we have a sit down and have a little talk about why you're feeling meh today? And this was conducted on a one-to-one -one basis. So this young person is 14 years old, got low self-esteem and confidence, and he enjoys reacting to negative behaviours, using negative na language to become part of the class. This person felt isolated, just like that autistic child, felt isolated and felt like if he reacted negatively, people would like him. And that's something we do see on a daily basis within our settings. So on the feeling chat, he put meh. So we brainstorm emotions. What is meh to him? Is it because you feel happy? Are you feeling sad? Angry? Frustrated? annoyed, and so forth. He told me he felt angry and added that he hated his mum. Now, hate is a very strong word. But we need to find out why he's angry at his mum. Is this something that we can, as professionals, help with? We started talking and started brainstorming stuff about his feelings. But then we turned a negative onto a positive and talked about what makes us happy. He started to talk about, of course, about his journey. I know he saw a cop car chase this morning and then the gridlock on the way to school. And he said that made him quite happy, quite amusing. So I said, why don't we base on stuff like this? The happy thoughts. Then he mentioned his girlfriend. Then he mentioned that he felt a little bit more on edge, more sad. That he was grieving for his nan, who died two years ago today. I gave him a little bit of time just to reflect before I asked another question. But I also asked him whether he wanted to continue or not. Because having bereavement within your house or within a close family member or friend, some people do not want to talk about it. But he talked about how he didn't feel angry with his mum. But it's because he was grieving over his nan's death that the closest person he can take it out on is his mum. And that's kind of similar to how we are with, as being teaching professionals, how the children take out on us and come angry with us because I can't deal with that emotion. The other children and learners returned back into the classroom and he expressed to the, his class how he was feeling that morning, which is brilliant. Praised him, well done, pat on the back, etc. Another young person expressed how their granddad recently died. And they started having this conversation about how they dealt with the grieving process. And now they use family members and professionals like ourselves to talk about it. Luckily enough, this young person is now receiving bereavement counselling. 
So I looked about expanding the lesson a little bit more and talk about the importance of them. Because stress and anxiety has been identified as the most common reason for sickness. Now that's in children and in teaching professions. A lot of teachers are going out on stress and sickness because of their own anxieties around them and their own stresses around them. But why? I want you to think of and write these numbers and names on a piece of paper. Numbering one to five, five being the least important of following. Family, friends, work, partner and me. Hopefully during this time, you will pause the PowerPoint and have a good think what's important to you. Now, I'm guessing from my own research that a lot of you would have put family and maybe friends first. Or maybe your partner, but you probably middle to bottom. I'm going to tell you a story. Now, this is a, a sad story about a plane plummeting into the sea. Oxygen masks come down as you and your child are the only two people of your whole family on that plane. Mask will come down. Who do you put it on? Do you put it on you? Or do you put it on your child? A lot of you would say, well, I'll put it on my child, wouldn't I? But how can the child then survive after if you're no longer there? You need to start thinking about you. You cannot help anybody else if you're not emotionally stable and well yourself. Now, I can tell this is getting quite deep and I apologise now if anyone is becoming upset or having any flashbacks from this. But I want to be honest and open with you guys that I put work first because that's what makes me happy and I put me last. But over time, I've realised that my work has been affected because of my own emotional well-being. So I put forward now that people, you need to start putting yourself more first. But this is the same as the children. Get them to put themselves first and think about themselves. You can imagine in class, the amount of times you say, why are you not doing your own thing? Why do you have to copy? Again, that can go to about that being wanting to be wanted by others, their friends being probably maybe more of a priority. Good thing to think about. I find sharing best practices a good thing. I wanted to tell you a story about an individual in the middle of the screen. This young person was an extremely emotional child going back three years, where it reverted a lot back to anger. I'm lucky to say a year ago, she went to um, work at Nunsforp Academy as a bit of a work experience once a week. As a reward, we treated her to a new uniform to feel part of the team. So she didn't feel like she was a student. We had some feedback from one of the professionals mentioning that she worked very closely with an autistic child. And previously, they would take over hours to get that young person from underneath the desk. It took this young person five minutes. Now I'm hoping that's down to what she's learned from her time at Parkside and her own emotional well-being being improved and become more stable. You can hold silent debates in other things, not get people to argue across the room, across the room. get them to write it down. Draw around the hand, talk about what's important to them. Get the students to teach the lesson. And these are a couple of the resources that hopefully you can incorporate into your setting that we have into ours. Now, these are only a select few because you probably find your own resources more beneficial and personalised to the children you have. So hopefully today you've understand the emotional aspect of it and how to incorporate into your daily routine. How to differentiate the activities based on the individual's requirements. Identify the need of intervention. And to remember that we are important. And then from that, you will incorporate data to support strengths and weakness, what's been successful and not successful. We are not going to be successful all the time. But we are here 
and we will make a difference. I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you again for um, taking this time to listen to my presentation. And hopefully you can incorporate these into your settings. I will leave you again with my favourite video.